that an heir as long as he is a child differs none from a slave though he is actually master of all so what does God do God puts him under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father understanding that God will take our purpose and our destiny and lock it up in other people God has ordained every one of your steps before one of them came to be God has already prepared a place for you to go into God's not trying to figure out for what you to do tomorrow God has already created space but he's locked it up in other people. I'm ready to give you this thing. I love when I get these rare opportunities to dig back in to teachings that literally change my life. Hopefully, it'll have that same impact on you today as you listen. <coughs> We've been talking about in the process of a turnaround, you know, what I call the downward part is where you got to look at it, where you've got to own it, where you've got to make peace with yourself. You've got to make peace with others who've been affected. You've got to make peace with God. You've got to learn from your pain. All those were the messages where I basically preached, take responsibility because as a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So in other words, you have the power to get the outcome you want and you have the power to change what you do not like when you will sow a different seed today that will get you out of the harvest. you got to have grace for the harvest from yesterday's decisions. But right now, while you are experiencing a negative harvest, you can ask God to give you a new bag of seed that we can sow for tomorrow. Remember that when those who go forth bearing seed, whatever you sowed in tears, you shall reap with joy, and he shall doubtless come again, bringing his sheaves with him. What does that mean? There comes a time where you're no longer crying over yesterday's mistake, but your tears are watering tomorrow's seed. Shoo, hallelujah. So in other words, there comes a time where I have got to learn to cry over the joys of my tomorrow instead of the regret of my past. Because if you cry and let your tears water the seeds, then you sow those seeds, you water those seeds, and all, all of a sudden next you have a different outcome. The organ has already started. I'm already preaching, and I haven't even got to my main text yet. I feel the Spirit of God. Look at your neighbor and say, this one's for you. Come on, tell them. This one's for you. So, as I talked our way down, I started talking our way back out. We've made the turn, and this is where I stopped last week, where Naomi came to Ruth in the story of Boaz. I'm not going to go all the way back into all the characters in the book of Ruth, but Naomi came to Ruth. Ruth's destiny is Boaz. Boaz is a wealthy man. He is a landowner. He has many harvesters, many employees. And Ruth <coughs> is a beggar <coughs> taking care of Naomi, her mother-in-law, after, after all of their husbands have died. There's a famine in the land, and she's walking around with mud between her toes and her hair matted with sweat and dust in her eyes, and she is a beggar picking up leftovers off the ground. Boaz does notice her one day and tells them to leave handfuls on purpose. In other words, don't take all of the good harvest and bring it in, but drop a little bit so that this lady that I've noticed out there can pick up the handfuls that you've dropped on purpose. But the fact is... Ruth's destiny was Boaz. She was begging in a field that God wanted her to own. So how is that gap going to close? She needs a turnaround. How do you go from someone who's in a famine picking up leftovers in a field trying to survive through the next meal to a person who is married to Boaz and you own the field that everybody's in and you have writing the paychecks of all the harvesters? How does God close that gap? How does that turnaround take place? Enter a mentor, a voice. Naomi said, I seek security for you. Basically, Boaz is your destiny, but right now, you're no different from all the other women. We're about to give you the pathway to separate yourself. And then she looked at her and said, I want you to wash yourself. I want you to anoint yourself. I want you to put on your best garment. I want you to go to the threshing floor where he's winnowing. 
She said, I want you to notice the place where he lies down. I want you not to say anything. And then when he wakes up and he recognizes you, then he will tell you what it is you should do. And this is the way Ruth responded. She said, all that you have said, I will do. All that you have said, I will do. Why is this difficult and why am I preaching it so forcefully and passionately? Because we are living in a generation that feels like their mothers and fathers dropped the ball, that they did not see their mothers and fathers live out on their daily lives the convictions they said that they held dear. And so in their mind, it was all hypocrisy, and they have a disrespect for authority. That disrespect for authority has now gone over to government officials. That disrespect has now gone over to law officials. That disrespect has now gone over to coaches. That disrespect has now gone over in our school system to teachers. That, that disrespect has gone over to any type of person in authority from their parents down, and we have a generation that says nobody is going to tell me what to do. This is the third week in the row I've, I've said it, and it bears saying it again. Again, when you will not listen to the voice of wisdom that God brings into your life, you have relegated God to only being able to teach you and move you forward through failure. So in other words, God's only tool of instruction will be pain. And that is ridiculous when someone enters your life who has already been where you're going and just simply acknowledging and honoring the wisdom that they're imparting to you and receiving that instruction can cause you to dodge one million landmines. But instead, we're going to do it our own way, which means we got to screw it up, clean up, and move an inch. Screw it up, clean it up, and move an inch. And you spend the majority of your energy, the majority of your life, and the majority of your anointing cleaning up the last mess that you you made, making very little movement into our potential. Preach Ron Carpenter. I feel this thing. Hallelujah. I hadn't done this in a while, but I feel this thing. <coughs> so she gives the instruction, and then she receives the instruction. So I talked about the importance of a mentoring voice the last couple of weeks, but now I want to talk about receiving that voice. Because it does not matter if the voice has been sent. Let me, let me back up. God can give me the most powerful message in the world to preach. But if you don't receive me, it has no ability to impact you. No ability. I, I'm the same way. There are people that I know too much. So that if I scroll across their sermon, I don't really pay attention. And, me, and that's with me knowing that sometimes God can use people who do not have it all together to bless me. Why? Because Ron Carpenter certainly doesn't have it all together. But it's hard to do. It's really hard to receive. When Jesus went back to his hometown, they did not receive him. Why? Because they watched him grow up. And that breeds familiarity. And familiarity is the death of honor. And it's the death of reception. And if you do not receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you miss the reward that has been sent. Let me go back to that verse and let me talk about it. Jesus said, if you receive me, you receive the one who sent me. So if you receive me, you have received the Father. Let me get it. Let's go the opposite. If you reject me, you miss God. God is packaged in me, and what God wants to do to you, he put it in me to bring it to you. Remember Galatians chapter 4, that an heir, as long as he is a child, differs none from a slave, though he is actually master of all. So what does God do? God puts him under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Understanding that God will take our purpose and our destiny and lock it up in other people. And they guard our life and they steward our life until we come to a place of maturity where God can release the inheritance that he has prearranged for us before God ever said, let there be light. God has ordained every one of 
of your steps before one of them came to be. God has already prepared a place for you to go into. God's not trying to figure out for what you to do tomorrow. God has already created space. He made a garden, then he made a man so that when the man showed up, there was a garden. Come on, somebody. He made the grass before he made the cattle. So when the cattle got there, there was already grass. Hallelujah. He made the water before he made any agriculture so that the water was there when the agriculture showed up. God already has a place prepared before you even got here, but he's locked it up in other people. And if you don't receive that voice, you can miss your next because you missed the package God wrapped it in. When you are in a painful season, let me tell you, God uses it to his benefit because the Bible says when we're being afflicted around us that God produces glory or weight within us. Does it seem that your life is headed in the wrong direction and a turnaround is needed? In this series, 180, Ron Carpenter will give you the keys to get you back on track. You come to God with the mess. You come to God dragging the chain. I have made a mess. I have lost my friends. I have been fired from my job. The government took my kids away from me. I've lost my kids. I can't. You got to drag your chains. Why? Because you were a son when you were with him, and you're going to be a son when you get back. This message is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now, and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. Hello, my friends. I just want to take a minute out of this word. I hope that you've been enjoying and uh, just speak to you a moment from my heart. You know, the Bible talks about a word in season to them that are weary. There's nothing like when you hit a dry place or a desperate place or a low place in your life, when God comes along and just brings somebody to speak a word, it can resurrect you, it can change you, it can encourage you, it can heal you, it can give you insight, it can give you wisdom. It can change everything. And we want to be that here at Ron Carpenter Television. And I hope the word has that kind of impact on your life. That's what we desire. I want to say just a moment, thank you to all of our contributors and our givers. Uh, we don't sell advertisements. We don't sell ads here. We just believe that there's an army of people in the earth that believe the cause of Christ is the greatest cause in the entire world. And because of that, they want to see the word go forth in every means that it can, and especially on TV, on the air. So thank you to those that have given weeks, months, years, and I know I'm dating myself, but yes, maybe even decades, as we've been doing this since 1998. You've helped us make this journey to where we're now sending this message out to as many or more people than we ever have. And uh, I want to say thank you for that, and we did not take it lightly. And I want to open up the circle for those who may want to be a part of this. Uh, there's two ways that you can give and be a part. Maybe you've never given to a ministry before. Maybe you were just scrolling and somehow this spoke into your need. Or maybe it's just something God's put in your heart that, you know what, it's time for me to give back. But wherever you may be, if you are inclined to give, there's two ways. You can give a one-time gift of whatever God's put in your heart to do, or you can become a part of the family, a monthly partner who says, I want to make sure this is staying on the air because it benefits me and I know it'll benefit others. And for whatever size gift that you have it in your heart to give, we just want to send you this gift to say thank you. No gift is insignificant and we place value on everybody who is a part of this ministry in any way. We're so grateful that you've seen us worthy and uh, of, the, of the gift that you want to give and the seed that you want to sow. And my prayer is that God would just return it unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. That's what I pray and that's what I declare over to you in this day. Thank you for your gifts. Now, let's get back to this word. What was Adam? The Bible says, in Adam all sinned. When Adam sinned, all died. The principle of representation. He was the first and everybody was in him. Then came a second Adam, the last Adam named Jesus Christ. In that Jesus Christ, all can be made alive. What is that? 
I didn't die for my sins. I didn't pay for my sins, but Jesus did. And by him representing me, I can receive him and my sins are washed away. And God saved me. I was born into sin through the principle of representation and I am cleansed from my sin through the principle of representation. Are you seeing what I'm saying today? So we've got to understand, if God is always represented in somebody, then the burden is on me to receive the one he's sending so I can get the blessing that they are carrying to me. Let's go if we would now. Come on to... Uh, <laughs> Let's go to John chapter 4. This is a longer one. Let me read this one first. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Next verse. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Excuse me. The woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Next verse. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband, Jesus said. You have, you, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five and the one who you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. <laughs> Pastor, how do I receive them? You receive them how you perceive them. Jesus has gone through a litany of whack, 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 back and forth because she just saw him as a Jew who had always disrespected Samaritans. <laughs> and Jesus knew that he had living water and a life change to bring... He is the voice coming to her that will change her life forever and she will become the first evangelist because she goes out to the whole town and says, come see a man who, tells, who told me everything I ever did. But before Jesus made any headway, he had to change her perception. So he shifted from a natural well to a spiritual well and got in the anointing. And when he got into the anointing and began to prophesy to her, her perception shifted and she said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Then she was able to receive from him. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get the reward. She couldn't get the reward he was bringing because she didn't perceive him as a prophet. So he had to shift that perception. And when he did, she received everything he had to say. You receive on the same level as you perceive. If you don't perceive properly, you will never receive properly. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about perception. Tell them, it's all about perception. Turn right here to Luke chapter 11. <coughs> Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. You know what? I've given you the wrong verse. It's supposed to be Matthew 11. My fault to everybody in the back, everybody out here. Receive me even though I do make mistakes. I wanted to go to the story of Martha and her sister Mary and Jesus visiting their house. Stay with me. Jesus comes to the house, Martha's fluffing pillows, sweeping floors, cooking food. Mary sits down and postures herself in worship at the feet of Jesus. 
This upsets Martha. To the point she requests Jesus to scold Mary to encourage Mary to get up and help her. Jesus responds to Martha with this. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried about or you are absorbed with many things, but only one thing is needful. Now listen to this statement because I never understood it till I understood this principle. This, 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 this word from Jesus all, never made sense to me till I understood the principle of representation. She said, oh, he said, only one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen the greater portion. Jesus is not 50-50 God and man. Jesus is 100-100. The Bible makes it clear he was all man, the son of man. And the Bible makes it clear that he was all God, the son of God. He was the fullness of the Godhead in a body. He was man carrying God. Okay? So when Jesus walks into a room, There is the man, Jesus. <coughs> then there is son of God, Jesus. And I get to choose which portion I am going to honor. Nothing is wrong with either one. Somebody's got to cook the food, and somebody's got to fluff the pillows, and somebody's got to dust the floor. And Martha has chosen to minister to his humanity. But Mary is postured in worship. She can't take her eyes off of him. She's hanging on every word he says. <laughs> and that worship posture is ministering to his deity. And he is Jesus the man. And he is Jesus the son of God. And both of them are all right to minister to. But Mary has chosen the greater portion. She chose to minister to his deity. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, and I'm going to land this plane. For the love of Christ compels us that we judge thus. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because I am so filled, touched, and changed by the love of Christ, I am pushed to perceive, judge, see, understand this way. That if one died for all, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one after the flesh. One of the most difficult statements in the entire Bible. I'd say top three most difficult statements that I know of in the entire Bible. He says, this is the way I look at people. That everything I don't like about you died when Jesus died. And if Christ died for it, then everything I don't like about you died with him. He said, the love of Christ compels me to see you that way. Instead of viewing everything about you that is flawed and everything about you that I do not like, the love of Christ shows me the treasure inside of you and I choose to see the God side and not look at the flesh side. Wow. And he said, from this moment forward, I regard no one after the flesh. What does that mean? Play something if you would, Terrence. <clears throat> Let me use me. Ron Carpenter walks into a room and grabs the microphone. I knew Ron when he started back in the early 90s. Man, he's made so many mistakes. So many bumps and bruises, I just know not. Okay, you know what you've just done? You're regarding me after my flesh. <laughs> You're not regarding me after my calling. You're not regarding me from all the men and women of God who have laid hands on me and spoken over me. You're not regarding me from all the generational anointings that have now come into my life. 
You're not regarding me by the elders that laid hands on me and called me into the ministry. You're not, you're not regarding me after all the divine moments I've had with God where he grew my faith, grew my anointing. You've chosen, you've chosen to view me after all the mistakes you saw me make. And there, a truckload. But when you see the mistake-filled run, even though God may have brought me something to change your life, you won't get it because you don't regard me properly. And I can see you coming down the hallway and you have the very thing in your life that I need and I may be at a, such a low point that people would be scared if they knew how low I was. But maybe I know too much about you. Maybe I had counseling sessions. Maybe you told me all your secrets. And because I regarded you after the flesh, I missed the moment. Jesus said, Mary has chosen the greater portion. Every Christian that walks into your life, they are the flesh of a person and they are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you get to choose which one you will regard. The judgment is on you. If you receive, if you judge, if you perceive, it wasn't whether or not Jesus was a prophet. It was whether or not she could perceive him as a prophet. When she did, she got the blessing that was on his life. You know what? It'd be difficult to close and, and someone that may have turned on the TV, turned the TV on lost and doesn't know Jesus, and then you move on from this program and you're still lost. I don't want that to ever be the case. I want you to know this Jesus that I'm talking about. I don't want you to know Ron's Jesus. I don't want you to know the church's Jesus. I don't want you to know your grandmother's Jesus. I want you to know him for yourself. And the way that you do that is to make him personal in your life by inviting him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Would you join me now if you'd like to do that? Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I confess my sins before you today and I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, you died and rose again on the third day for my salvation. Wash me and make me clean. Come live in my heart from this moment. I accept your gift of salvation today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you gotta call us. You gotta write us. You gotta email us. You gotta let us know here at Ron Carpenter Television. And I'm so grateful that you just made the greatest decision that you could ever make. Thank you for this time that we've had with you. And until next time, may God's blessing, blessings richly fall on your life. Because the Bible says when we're being afflicted around us that God produces glory or weight within us. Does it seem that your life is headed in the wrong direction and a turnaround is needed? In this series, 180, Ron Carpenter will give you the keys to get you back on track. You come to God with the mess. You come to God dragging the chain. I have made a mess. I have lost my friends. I have been fired from my job. The government took my kids away from me. I've lost my kids. I can't. You got to drag your chains. Why? Because you were a son when you were with him, and you're going to be a son when you get back. This message is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now, and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.